IDZs and SEZs. Do we really need them in South Africa? <laughs> it's, it's my job to say yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's my job to have different opinions here this morning. I think we do, because they, they, they provide you a platform um, through which you can enhance production of exports. But remember, special economic zones are not just about producing and exports. In their nature, they're really also about regional development. And if we are honest, we'll agree um, that South Africa is struggling a little when it comes to that. Um, you know, what do we need to do to make the different regions, for instance, of, of, of the country, or for that matter, going back to Gauteng, competitive? What are the things that are, by their nature, nuanced uh, for location, for instance, on the Western Corridor, and I'm now talking within the Gauteng uh, context. What are the things that are nuanced for location on the Northern Corridor, and that's what um, the Gauteng government has tried to do. So I would argue that we do need them. I would also venture, though, that we do need to be better at them. Just because we need them and we are doing them doesn't mean that we've perfected them. If you go back to the history of IDZs, they've been around for a while. They started in the mid-90s. Kuha um, was one of the first. You had East London. If you go back, they've been around for quite a while. And depending on who you ask, there will be different views as to whether or not Kuha has been successful as an industrial development zone. I think they are, they are there now, but it took a long time to get to where they are. Um, the same applies to some of the different SEZs or IDZs in the country, and we are no exception as OA Tambo. I think it took us a little while to kind of get our house in order and get going. Uh, but by their nature, special economic zones are intended to do a couple of things. The first is to drive regional development, because the special economic zone is located in a particular region. For it to work, you have to respond to if you have people that are producing, how are they exporting those particular goods? So again, the issues of transportation that we're talking about now become key. The issue of the ports or the airports become key. Where are they getting the water? Is this water system sufficient? Um, you know, we are so focused on electricity and we've gone a couple of, we're going almost into two months now without load shedding, so we're like, yay. But you know, we also have to think about the water system, the sewage system, what's the capacity? So these are all the things that SEZs by their nature must respond to because if you're gonna crowd in investments that are intended to enhance productivity for exports, you should be able to respond to the issues of electricity. You should be able to respond to the issues of how do you move the goods in an efficient and um, you know, quick manner? Um, where do you get the water? Where do you get those particular inputs that would make it competitive? And if you do that, you should be able to develop zones that um, are really competitive, not just from a South African or continental, but from a global perspective. China followed the SEZ model, and they've done mm -hmm. tremendously well. So, um, and, and a few others, even in, in, in the EU, um, Ireland is also an example that has done SEZs, and they've done tremendously well. There are always mixed views. Some have done better than others. In Africa, we see quite a few of them coming up. Some are better than others. In South Africa, the question you've posed, we have quite a number. Do we need so many? Perhaps it's one that uh, uh, Sandile's new boss will, will think about when he comes in. But certainly, um, the argument initially was that you can't have IDZs because when they started, they were linked to ports of entry. Mm -hmm. which meant that your inland provinces could not have these SEZs. It meant it would either be um, Eastern Cape, or East London, your Kuha, you know, you, or Atambo, of course, because of the, of the airport. And so what happens to your free state? What happens to those inland provinces, the Northwest, etc.? And so the SEZ was intended to give everybody a chance. But in giving that chance, I do believe that we have to have a sit down and think about you know, how many do we need? And if we need as many as we say that we need, are they efficient or should we be able to work better in ensuring that we enhance the, 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 the production, but that we respond to all those issues? Because those issues matter. If I produce and my products are at the port for X number of days, it doesn't matter that I got 
um, incentives from the SEZ or that there is a, uh, um, you know, a trade agreement that will benefit me. Correct. In the end, I'm, I'm not competitive. I'm perplexed anymore. by it for the simple reason is that if we, let's just say we get one particular one very right in a, very, in a really good way, if we can do it within an SEZ, why can't we do it you know, for businesses outside the SEZ in the country as a whole um, as well? Um, it's like almost what happened here in 2010. We had this phenomenal roaming courts uh, during the time, mm -hmm. great at building new stadiums and, 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 um, and infrastructure, and then sort of after that, the wheels came off again. Um, Sandile, to you, um, what is going to, what, what is likely in your view going to change in the next 10 years in trade and industry versus what we've seen over the last decade? Are there big changes in the pipeline that you suspect may um, be rather different compared to the path that we've been on for the last decade or so? So you're assuming that I'm going to have a new boss. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the wall. That the right. cat is out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> that one is bolted. I was driving, so I haven't seen the news, so I've, I've yet to see that. Well, firstly, I think... Uh, What's going to change is it depends on whether we continue and, or, uh, rather than to start new things. Because many a time we start new things and then there's change of administration and new people come in and then they come with their own plans. So we build many foundations but never actually build up the building for it to be completed. So if we can have continuity on some of the things that are working, of course some might have to change because they're not working. I think that'll be good. Um, but for the DTI at the moment, especially on international trade, we, our focus over the next five to 10 years will be on the implementation of the African continental free trade area. Because we see it as a very big uh, game changer for the country, I think, mm -hmm. and for the continent. Given the protectionism that is growing uh, all over the world, in particular in the US and Europe. And therefore, we only have ourselves, uh, we believe, uh, to, to develop. Uh, but what needs to happen is for us as a continent to learn to observe uh, contracts and the rule of law. Yes, we may have signed the agreement, but we'll, we implement it. Will countries observe their obligations? Uh, I think that's a challenge. I think one of the main challenges or problems with SADAC is that many countries go back, renege on what they have signed, then they want to roll back some of the liberalization that they've done in terms of opening trade because they've got uh, exchange rate challenges, mm. they've got economic crisis and stuff like that. And that tends to undermine what we've been doing. But they have been working in the continent somehow because what we have seen is in the regions where there are free trade areas in the continent, there has been a significant growth of trade amongst those countries. And not only is there growth of trade, trade is happening mostly on manufactured products rather than, than just there on uh, unprocessed minerals. If you take South Africa, for instance, in Sadak and Saku, we trade about 41%, if not more, of what we trade with the rest of the continent with um, SACO. And uh, if you add SADAC, and the, including the other two countries like Angola and the DRC that are not yet signatories to the protocol on trade, we, uh, they account for about 90% of our trade with the rest of the continent. So that shows that when we've got trade agreements, they tend to work. And therefore, we foresee that as we extend uh, our trade agreements are uh, outside the SADAC region to the rest of the continent, we will see opening up of markets in the East, Central, West, and North Africa. Of course, it won't be easy because they are further, they are further than, they, than these others are, and therefore it's going to take a, a bit more work. Uh, also, countries would have to put in institutions, they must put in policies, they must harmonize rules, and they must uh, ensure that uh, we avoid uh, reneging on what we have signed. And therefore, we are throwing a lot into this. And we suppose we think that it's going to have spin-offs for our manufacturing, because in order for us to grow our exports, we're going to need manufacturing and investment. Mm. Part of the reason we think it's going to be successful or useful 
is because it is the most comprehensive agreement that we've ever been party to. It involves not just trade in goods. If you look at the US, there is, there is an arrangement to allow us to trade in goods only. If you look at the EU, it's a free tra mm. trade agreement on trade in goods. If you look at SADAC, it's mostly trade in goods, although now we're moving to services and so on. After the same thing. This one includes trade in services. Mm. It includes uh, promotion and protection of investment. It includes digital trade. It includes cooperation policy. It includes uh, women and youth in trade, amongst others. Mm. So therefore, it covers all aspects of business, even beyond the border. So we believe that it's going to create a conducive env environment for investors. It's going to open up trade amongst African countries and therefore create a bigger market that is more cohesive than it is now. And therefore, it should attract investors who are looking for bigger markets uh, in the continent. So we are investing a lot and putting a lot on this. But to ensure that uh, it is utilized, we're going to be establishing uh, national implementation committees that is going to involve business and other stakeholders so that they are party to the implementation and the rolling out of this agreement to all regions and districts of the country. So uh, for us, that is the main focus. Of course, we have to work into the sector plans to make sure that they support uh, what we are trying to export to the, to the continent. Of course, we, was, we, we don't, it doesn't mean that we're turning away from the US, from Europe, and else, elsewhere, <coughs> but it means that we want to, to retain those markets and hopefully to grow our access to the Asian markets such as China and so on. <laughs>